Good evening. It's a great honor and privilege to present my case for tonight's Pau Leap in front of our esteemed panelists and colleagues. I would especially like to acknowledge Dr. Juan Paulo de los Santos, President of Rizal Ophthalmology Society, for giving me the opportunity to represent my institution, Fatima University Medical Center, Department of Ophthalmology, headed by Dr. Juan Lopez, our Chairman, Dr. Carlo Nasol, Vice Chairman and RTO, and Dr. Ernesto Pangalangan Jr., Head of Glaucoma Section, as well as my advisor for this case. Tonight, I would like to share a somewhat uncommon glaucoma case managed in our eye clinic. Considered as an inflammatory eye disease with unpredictable acute episodes, interspersed with quiet periods, and a mysterious clinical course. My name is Dr. Alvin Villas, presenting posner schlossman Syndrome, Now You See Me, Now You Don't, a uveitic glaucoma case report. This presentation is purely for academic purposes, and I have no financial disclosures or conflict of interest. The contents of my report include a presentation of a case of uveitic glaucoma, the disease entities that it closely resemble and their key features, the clinical course of our patient, and the current insight into the pathophysiology, possible etiologies, treatment approach, and prognosis of this disease. Okay, let's get started. Glaucoma is the result of the death of retinal nerve fiber layer, which presents as a permanent loss to a field of vision. It is not a single disease entity, but rather a heterogeneous group that are characterized by widely diverse clinical manifestations and variable pathophysiologic mechanisms. In order to form a complete picture of a glaucoma case, it is essential to observe the patient at frequent intervals and over a relatively long period. A case, ideal in this sense, presented itself in an eye doctor who lived in the immediate vicinity and thus was able to visit the patient at the earliest indication of an oncoming attack. This patient had recurrent one-sided attacks of ocular hypertension associated with cells in the acus and a few keratic precipitates, which disappeared shortly after the tension returned to normal. This observation of the time relation of the appearance of ocular hypertension and inflammation could then be accurately studied. This presentation, which was eventually called glaucomatocyclitic crisis, is a syndrome first described by Dr. Adolf Posner and Abraham Schlossman in 1948. They described seven general characteristics of the syndrome and they are as follows. The disease is unilateral. The presenting symptom is usually mild discomfort or mild visual blur, although the patient may also be asymptomatic. The eye appears generally white and quiet, although mild corneal edema may develop as a result of increase in IOP. Ocular hypertension coincides with a mild anterior uveitis. The anterior chamber angle is open. The ocular hypertension can last from a few hours to one month, but rarely over two weeks. And episodes of attacks may occur without apparent cause and vary in frequency over periods of time. A patient with a similar clinical picture consulted our eye clinic in the afternoon of November 2020 due to blurred vision on the left eye. The patient is a 50-year-old female who sought consult for the first time in our institution. It started as a frontal headache which was manageable associated with feeling of tired eyes. The next day, she noted redness on the left eye which then eventually progressed to a mild blurring of vision with halos especially while looking at bright lights. She did not instill any non-prescribed eye drops nor had taken any oral medications. Persistence of the signs and symptoms prompted consult. The rest of the history and the review of systems were normal except for the identified signs and symptoms. Uncorrected distance visual acuity on the right eye is 2020, while it's 2025 on the left, and the refraction was essentially plano. Pupils responded briskly to light and without afferent defect. Upon doing aplanation tonometry, the pressure in the right eye was noted at 12 millimeters of mercury, while on the left eye, it was 46. Slit lamp examination showed a relatively normal right anterior segment, while the left eye showed mild conjunctival hyperemia, a few small to moderate sized round white KPs located in ferrocentrally, grade 4 van Herrick tray cells, 
and grade 1 nuclear opacification of the lens. Gonioscopy revealed anterior chamber angles that were open 360 degrees to the sclerospur with iris processes seen at 3 and 9 o'clock hour position and a 1 plus pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork in both eyes. There was no evidence of angle closure or peripheral anterior synechia in either eye. The initial slit lamp fundus examination showed asymmetrical looking optic discs. The vertical cup to disc ratio is 0.4 on the right and 0.5 on the left. The optic nerves of both eyes have distinct rims and without apparent nerve fiber layer defects. At this point, the patient's clinical picture revealed a minimal non granulomatous anterior uveitis, a concurrent marked elevation of the left IOP, but otherwise normal looking disc. There was no evidence of anterior chamber angle closure. There was also no evidence of posterior uveitis or retinal vasculitis. Since the patient presented with a one-sided acute attack of very high IOP, we promptly started the patient on oral acetazolamide and instilled one drop of brimonidine plus timolol on the left eye. Patient remained in the clinic and we planned on repeating the IOP measurement after one hour. The ophthalmic signs and symptoms of our patient were consistent with the 1948 case series by Dr. Poster and Schlossmann known as glaucomatocyclitic crisis. From here on, I will refer to this disease as posner schlossmann syndrome or simply PSS. While we waited for the response of the patient to the medications, a review of the key features of our patient were laid out and other disease entities that closely resembled the presentation of our patient were entertained and ruled out. Our patient is a 50-year-old female who presented with unilateral ophthalmic signs and symptoms for the first time. The acute onset of a unilateral blurring of vision, eye redness, headache, and halos around lights associated with markedly high IOP could be due to an acute angle closure attack. However, angle closure attack would usually present with a more pronounced eye pain, frontal headache, blurring of vision and halos around lights with eye signs such as diffuse corneal edema, cells and flare, and a fixed mid-dilated pupil. Ultimately, the gonioscopic finding of an open angle without any angle abnormalities would rule out acute angle closure attack as the cause of our patient's symptoms. Nevertheless, a patient who presents with these acute signs and symptoms in the emergency department should raise the suspicion of an acute angle closure attack since glaucomatous damage typically ensues quickly if the attack is not managed immediately. PSS could occasionally be asymptomatic even if the IOP is markedly high. In addition, the anterior chamber inflammation and corneal signs are minimal and discrete and therefore could be missed at the initial eye exam. If the patient is seen in between attacks of PSS and would only present with a glaucomatous optic disc plus an open anterior chamber angle, it might lead to a diagnosis of primary open angle glaucoma or normal tension glaucoma. Although unclear, a previous study have found up to a 45% concomitance between PSS and POAG. In fact, a previous study described a case series of 11 PSS patients, some of whom demonstrated persistent elevated IOP in the affected eye between episodes, as well as fellow eyes with an elevated IOP. A close relative of PSS in terms of the clinical presentation is the Fuchs uveitis syndrome or FUS, more commonly known as Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis. FUS would also present with a unilateral increase in IOP but not PSS high. The FUS would also show mild eye redness and minimal AC inflammation. The difference to PSS lies in the presence of stellate shaped diffuse distribution of corneal KPs the development of iris heterochromia, the involvement of the anterior vitreous, and the propensity to develop a posterior subcapsular cataract. Unlike PSS, which behaves as a unilateral acute and recurrent eye disease, FUS has a more chronic and progressive nature. In addition, the usual reason for a Fuchs initial eye consult would not be because of eye pain, redness, and headache, but rather due to a unilateral bearing of vision secondary to a posterior subcapsular cataract. They would also present in a much older patient. It should be noted, however, that FUS would not always present with the typical clinical picture of iris heterochromia, 
diffuse stellate KPs, vitritis, and cataract. In fact, in some case reports, PSS could also present with iris heterochromia and cataract, and other studies observed a patient who initially presented and had been treated as PSS but after many years had converted to FUS. Another striking similarity between the two is their association to herpes viridae infection, most commonly to cytomegalovirus infection, although the exact cause of PSS and FUS remain unsolved up to this day Many studies have found the presence of CMV virus in the aqueous humor of these patients. This now leads us to a group of virus that should always be part of the differentials in a patient who presents with an acute unilateral hypertensive anterior uveitis. They are the herpetic anterior uveitis group. Typically, they are seen in the older population group and before the appearance of eye symptoms, would disclose a history of skin rashes either in vesicular pustular form around the eyelids or lips, or rashes in a dermatomal distribution in the face. They would also affect the cornea either in the form of an epithelial and stromal keratitis or endotheliitis. However, keep in mind that a history of typical skin rashes and findings of keratitis in these patients are not a rule because in a small percentage of patients, they are absent. Striking features in the herpetic anterior uveitis, especially in simplex and zoster, are the findings of posterior synechiae, pupil irregularity, and characteristic patterns of iris atrophy. Another feature is the increase in IOP that parallels the anterior chamber inflammation in simplex and zoster. If we would choose a specific herpes viridae anterior uveitis that could closely resemble the presentation of PSS and FUS, it would be CMV anterior uveitis. For one, CMV anterior uveitis does not usually present with epithelial and stromal keratitis, irregular pupils, and posterior synechiae. Vitritis is absent, although could be present in chronic CMV disease. The AC inflammation and KPs are usually minimal, but could be accompanied by a very high spike in IOP similar to PSS. CMV is also known to affect the endothelial cells of the cornea causing endotheliitis and a decrease in endothelial cell density. Coin-shaped lesions in which small size KPs are distributed in a ring pattern may be seen in acute and chronic CMV infection and are said to be pathognomonic of CMV. I will not go further in detail about the many differences, similarities, and overlaps among these diseases for it's beyond the scope of this case report. However, it is very important that these differentials be considered and ruled out because although all of them would need treatment to control increase in IOP and most to control inflammation, they certainly would have different etiologies and mechanisms, thus would follow a typical disease course and a different disease outcome. Going back to our case, repeat measurement of the IOP using applanation tonometry revealed a pressure of 10 mm of mercury on the right eye and a drop to 24 mm of mercury on the left eye. The patient was advised to continue medications and to follow up the next day. The patient was also started on prednisolone eye drops on the left eye. The next day, Eye pressures were normal at 12 and 14 mm of mercury. Slit lamp findings showed a clear cornea, few KPs, and a quiet anterior chamber. Patient symptoms also disappeared. Glaucoma screening tests were also done. This is the glaucoma panel done the following day. Pachymetry reveals central corneal thickness of 512 microns on the right eye and 504 microns on the left eye. The OCT nerve shows vertical cup-to-disc ratio of 0.6 on the right and 0.5 on the left. There is a non-specific thinning on the temporal circumpapillary RNFL quadrant on the right eye, while the left eye shows a superior quadrant RNFL thinning. However, the CT standard 30-2 perimetry with good reliability showed no specific visual field loss on both eyes and a glaucoma hemifield test within normal limits. Altogether, the glaucoma screening panel is read as glaucoma suspect on the left eye, probably preparametric glaucoma. 
The plan is to closely monitor the patient's eye symptoms, eye inflammation, and IOP. After one month of weekly IOP and slit lab exams while on topical anti-glaucoma and steroid eye drops, the left eye became quiet and the pressure maintained at a normal range. At this point, combination anti-glaucoma drops was shifted to more therapy and Pred Forte was shifted to fluoromethylone eye drops. After one month of quiescence and controlled eye pressure, we decided to observe the response of the eye if the anti-glaucoma and steroid drops were put on hold. Patient was advised to come back immediately if eye symptoms were noted. Otherwise, the patient was advised to follow up regularly. On the third month, patient reported no symptoms while on drug holiday. VA was noted at 2020 on left and right eyes. However, pressure on the left was noted at 32 millimeters of mercury and slit lamp exam found trace cells in a few small white and ferrocentral KPs. The patient was restarted on brimonidine and FML drops. Patient was monitored weekly and steroid eye drops was tapered according to clinical response while being maintained on brimonidine. Nine months after the first consult, the patient presented with a mild visual blur, mild eye redness, and left frontal headache. IOP measured 10 on the right and 46 on the left. The left eye showed mild conjunctival hyperemia, a clear cornea with a few small white and paracentral KPs, grade 4 Van Herrick, plus 1 cells, and grade 1 opacity of the lens. Gonioscopy revealed open angles to SS 360 degrees without abnormal angle vessels and PAS. Fundus findings were normal and without obvious glaucomatous optic nerve changes. We decided to start on loading oral acetazolamide 500 mg and pred forte eye drops. Brimonidine was continued as well. The following day, the left eye became quiet and IOP was noted at 15 on the right and 12 on the left. The patient was advised to continue brimonidine and pred forte eye drops until the next follow-up. After one month of treatment and observation, Brimonidine was shifted to a combination of brimonidine and brinzolamide eye drops and Pred Forte was shifted to lotepredinol eye drops. Over the subsequent patient follow-up and until this day, there were no acute attacks recorded. Optic nerve examination every follow-up and repeat of perimetry showed no glaucomatous progression. This is a line graph of the patient's intraocular pressures during her clinical course. As shown, there were four episodes of increased IOP in a span of 15 months. Two episodes which were nine months apart had the most significant spike in IOP and were accompanied by eye symptoms. Also take note that at several points when the PSSI is in the quiet phase, the right intraocular pressure was relatively higher. This phenomenon is known as the IOP crossover phenomenon which could be a characteristic finding that would help in the diagnosis of PSS. Several studies describe this phenomenon, including a published observational study wherein they investigated the characteristic of IOP dynamic change from an attack to intermittent period in patients with PSS. They confirmed that during the PSS attack, the mean IOP of the affected eyes was 47 mm of mercury, which was significantly higher than that of the contralateral eyes. However, during the intermittent period, the mean, peak, and valley IOPs of the contralateral eyes detected by the 24-hour measurements were all higher than those of the affected eyes. In clinics, once the IOP crossover phenomenon disappears, the PSS may develop into glaucoma, so this phenomenon has an important predictive value on the outcome of the disease. PSS is a rare condition in the United States. It is more common in Asia and Europe. In Finland, the incidence is 0.4 and the prevalence is 1.9 per 100,000 population. In Japan, among more than 2,000 cases of uveitis, 1.8% had PSS. Almost exclusively affects individuals aged 30 to 50 years. However, there are reports of rare episodes in individuals older than 60 years as well as in adolescents. Most studies report men to be at higher risk of developing PSS. The exact pathophysiology of PSS is still unknown. However, one case of a patient with PSS who underwent trabeculectomy for uncontrolled IOP on medical treatment demonstrated presence of mononuclear cells in the trabecular meshwork of an intraoperative specimen. 
On electron microscopy, mononuclear cells were seen intercalated in the trabecular meshwork with long pseudopods, possibly impeding the outflow of aqueous. The origin of these mononuclear cells is still unknown. A study on the morphology of the trabecular meshwork in Schlem's canal in PSS patients found that trabecular meshwork thickness of the affected eyes were significantly greater than those of the fellow eyes. As a result of inflammation, a thick and edematous TM was proposed as a potential reason for the elevated IOP in PSS. Furthermore, they found out that in a group of PSS patients whose TM edema did not persist, anti-inflammatory drugs alone were enough to lower down the IOP compared to a group of PSS patients who has persistent trabecular edema and persistently high IOP despite treatment. It is also postulated that the inflammation of the trabecular meshwork may be mediated by prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, particularly prostaglandin E, have been found in higher concentration in the aqueous humor of patients during acute attacks but not in between PSS episodes. During the acute phase of PSS, optic nerve head configuration and retinal blood flow rates are temporarily altered. Following resolution of the acute attack, these changes are reversed without any permanent damage. Transfer coefficients of fluorescein in aqueous in the anterior chamber are elevated during attacks of PSS. In between attacks, both coefficients return to normal. PSS is a unique condition in that it is inflammatory but causes ocular hypertensive effects. Normally, ocular inflammation results in a decreased IOP secondary to inflammatory damage to the ciliary body thus lowering the production of aqueous humor. However, IOP elevation may occur due to inflammatory damage to the trabecular meshwork, clogging of the trabecular meshwork with inflammatory debris, or an increase in aqueous viscosity due to the presence of inflammatory byproducts. However, these conditions usually occur in chronic inflammation, whereas PSS is an acute condition. Acute attacks of PSS are managed with topical IOP lowering drops with or without oral IOP lowering agents as well as anti-inflammatory drops such as prednisolone. Between episodes of PSS, the IOP is usually within a normal range. This characteristic helps distinguish PSS from other forms of inflammatory glaucoma that include subacute or chronically elevated IOP. Most PSS patients adequately treated for acute episodes of IOP elevation completely recover without long-term sequela, while a portion of patients may develop glaucomatous optic nerve damage and various visual field defects after repeated events. However, treatment during remission is not necessary because the frequency of further attacks is not influenced by unremitting treatment. The etiology of this disease remains unclear and potential contributing factors include CMB infection, autonomic defects and dysregulation, autoimmune disease, HSB infection, helicobacter pylori infection, and insufficient ocular blood supply due to peripheral vascular disease. While no etiology has been confirmed, it is widely speculated that PSS is caused by an acute inflammation of the trabecular meshwork that impedes aqueous humor outflow. Furthermore, the exact cause of this trabeculitis has not been determined, although there is support for an infective trigger. Although CMV infection was once believed to rarely cause ocular symptoms in immunocompetent persons, there have been many reports of ocular involvement published. Unlike the posterior segment involvement in the immunocompromised, the major site of involvement in the immunocompetent is in the anterior segment. CMV-related anterior uveitis may present as recurrent episodic iritis with raised IOP resembling PSS, a chronic anterior uveitis mimicking FUS, or as corneal endotheliitis. Most cases have been reported from Asia where there is a high seroprevalence of CMV. CMV anterior uveitis usually affects individuals from the third decade onwards, particularly Asians and males. Those in their 3rd to 5th decade present with PSS, while those in the 5th to 7th decade present with chronic CMB anterior uveitis resembling FUS. It is acute and recurrent in patients younger than 40 years of age or chronic in those above 40 years of age.
The IOP often exceeds 50 mm of mercury during the attack in the presence of subtle subepithelial edema. The severely elevated IOP is often out of proportion to the findings of mild anterior segment inflammation. The goal of giving antiviral treatment is to stop or dramatically lessen the recurrence of attacks in CMV-confirmed PSS. However, there has been no established effective protocol for giving these antiviral drugs. Most of the published literature recommended a longer period of antiviral treatment, but the question of CMV resistance, as well as the possible toxic effect of these drugs, has to be considered. In a study by Jop et al., they have found that the only factor that was predictive of the development of glaucoma in PSS patients was the duration of the disease. The risk of glaucoma developing after 10 or more years of exposure is 2.8 times higher than in those with less than 10 years of the disease. In a study by Maruyama et al., PSS patients with a higher corneal endothelial cell reduction ratio, a higher maximum IOP, greater visual field loss, and higher positive number of CMV in the aqueous humor tended to be more likely to require progressive treatments such as glaucoma surgery. Previous reports showed that endothelial cell density is lower in the affected eyes of PSS patients than in the contralateral unaffected eyes because of the repeated occurrence of attacks of high IOP. They found in this study that an endothelial cell reduction ratio of 22.6% was the cutoff point for the need for surgical treatment. There is no evidence that laser trabeculoplasty is useful in patients with PSS, thus it should be avoided in these patients. The following are key points in this case. Look at the complete picture, not just the pressure, the angles, and the nerve. Always look for subtle signs of corneal deposits and anterior chamber reaction. You must counsel patients regarding the nature of this disease and its clinical course. Treatment in between attacks is not proven to prevent future recurrences. Viral causation is not established and antiviral treatment is still controversial. Also, laser and surgical options are still under study. These are my references. And again, Big thanks to Pauli, Dr. Pangalangan, Dr. De Los Santos, and Dr. Nasol. Good evening and thank you for listening.